you welcome and thank you for joining us for the last panel discussion of the conference. Uh, my name is Carrie Scott and uh, I will be the moderator for this session. Today I am pleased to introduce our terrific panel of experts. Each of the speakers has been asked to share how their non-commercial open access publishing model or service is working to align their practices with the open access values of fairness, equity, and community. These presentations and the Q&A that will follow offer a really nice bookend to the opening session of the OASPA conference because the panelists work and experiences really demonstrate how focusing on values, uh, focusing on values, principles, and reminding oneself of the end goal of open access leads to successful approaches. Their discussions will provide tangible examples of how the equity promise of open access can be affected. They will share their experiences with interrogating, assessing, and supporting different constituency needs, and in doing so, will remind us all of the continuing imperative to invest in multiple pathways towards open access. Just going to share my screen. Catherine Skinner will start us off today by asking what values should underpin scholarly communication and publishing? How do we know? And how can we assess if the services we offer are aligning with the values we have identified? Abel Packer will describe the underlying values of the Cielo way to open science. Anne Brackenbury will ask how do we value and ensure the ongoing survival of small scholar-led diamond OA journals that are characterized more by their fierce independence and commitment to social justice than to conformity to traditional scholarly publishing standards? And how can these values be leveraged to develop a mutual aid network of support? Joe DeVille will discuss the challenges, the challenge of reconsidering the relationship between value and values in open access book publishing. He will discuss how he and his COPEM colleagues have explored this question in relation to scholarly infrastructures as they have worked to found the Open Book Collective. Sorry, advanced. Um, our final speaker, Dr. Francois Van Schalquick, will posit that a preoccupation with open access models drowns out the values that should underpin open access monograph publishing. He will discuss African Minds, which has adopted a book processing charge model, and he will contend that the model does not necessarily mean that the publisher is not driven by a core set of values that are closely aligned with those of science. I think what is especially interesting about bringing this collection of speakers together is that they're each addressing supporting open access foundational values from a different vantage point, and in doing so demonstrate both how both specific and universal the application of those values can be. As a collections librarian whose work revolves around determining how to mindfully and fairly expend a finite and often depreciating set of resources to support faculty research. It's especially resonant for me to be reminded of the bigger picture, that what are we trying to do here are aspects of this work, because I think collections librarians are often buffeted between supporting the stated needs of their faculty, which are often paywalled and ceaseless and the imperative to be part of changing the model. I think the big efficiencies offered by commercial publisher transformative agreements in particular have dominated because they are representing the, um, the status journals, the things that faculty say they need for promotion and tenure, for example. And for my library, at least, they have been easy to implement. But focusing on status and ease is a bit of a trap I realize, on the road to truly making open access equitable. And I'm really excited to hear about strategies that take us back to the bigger point of all of this work. And I'm looking forward to the discussion. So I'll just go over a couple of logistics and then we'll get to it. Um, our, so the speakers will each speak for about 10 minutes. And the last when the last speaker is done, we'll move to, we'll move to the Q&A portion. So please, I think you've all know the drill by now, put your questions in the Q&A, but please do uh, continue to use the chat to um, talk to each other and comment and share your experiences. 
Um, and then I do have one final programming note before we start. After this session is done, please do stay on for the OASPA chair, Jennifer Gibson, who's going to offer some closing remarks for the conference. So over to you, Catherine. Wonderful, and thanks, Carrie. All right, so let me share my screen. So rather than focusing on a publishing model or a solution, which the rest of my uh, panelists will be doing, my brief talk today will focus on the values part of this panel's purpose explicitly. So our panel is called Pathways to OA, Values-Based Publishing Models. But that immediately makes me wonder, what do we mean by values-based? Whose values? Evidenced how and why? So part of what we're trying to grapple with today, not just in our panel, but across the field of Skull Com, and it certainly was there in the, the previous panel, is a critical set of questions about values. So first, what values should underpin and guide the services that are offered in scholarly communication and publishing? Second, how do we know or agree upon such values? And how can we and should we, above all, uh, assess how well services are aligning with particular values? So I've been immersively working on these questions in a research project called Next Generation Library Publishing over the last few years. And in the next few minutes, I'll share some of our findings, including which values seem to be most commonly held or aspired to in the space and by whom. And I'll also talk about the challenges that services face in demonstrating their alignment with values. And I'll speculate about what it might look like if services had a more clear values framework to help guide their work. And as part of this, I'll introduce the forest framework, which Sarah Lippincott and I co-authored earlier this year and our team uh, helped us develop. And I'll especially highlight the transparency section. It's just an example of how that works. And then I'll wrap by considering what might it look like if clients and customers and uh, service providers all have a fully realized values framework within which we can consider and assess what it is that we're doing. So I'll start with the research project. Um, the one that's given us the time and the bandwidth to wrestle with these questions is the NGLP project, Next Generation Library Publishing, which has been generously funded by Arcadia. And the project has focused on improving publishing pathways and services for authors, editors, and readers by bridging and expanding several key open source publishing and repository tools, namely OJS, Janeway, and DSpace. And by thinking deeply about how to guide the hosts and the service providers that are using those open source tools toward behaviors that align with common academic values. And the project's been a huge lift. Um, lots of technical, social, and business-based outputs. And we really do believe that these outputs are going to have a transformative impact on certainly library publishing and through it, the broader scholarly publishing space, both technically and philosophically. So I'd love to tell you a whole bunch of things about the project, including its relationship to Diamond OA and other things, but time's limited. So look at that third goal that I've got here, um, which is creating a more balanced scholarly publishing ecosystem that aligns with academic values. Before we could align anything with academic values, we really had to define what do we mean by that phrase? So as a first step in that direction of defining academic values, in 2019 and 2020, we proposed and answered two main research questions. First, are there common values and principles in scholarly communication that we can distill and document? And then second, are there models for how to move from stating values to assessing and measuring an entity's alignment with those values? And our initial findings, including context about the role that's currently played by values in scholarly communication, are documented in a 2020 uh, Living Our Values and Principles report, which I co-authored with Sarah Wimperman. And what we did was we canvassed English language web circulated values and principles documentation in the area of academic publishing. And we didn't have to start from scratch. We had the brilliant charters list that Force 11 Scholarly Commons Working Group developed years ago, which already contains more than 100 declarations, charters, and other documents in the fields of technology, research, scholarly communication, data, publishing, et cetera. So we reviewed that full body of content. And we also conducted an in-depth analysis of nine documents, including Principles for Open Scholarly Infrastructure, POSI, uh, the Vienna Principles, and the FAIR Principles. And this is a real quick snapshot of some of our findings, which include that there's a sizable genre of these materials. And by the early 2000s, they had really come out with all of these you know, manifestos, declarations, petitions, statements, policies, lots of different ways of these documents coming out. 
And these documents have often centered on the core issue of open, including advocating for publishing open access content and in open source platforms. These values and principle statements have tended towards opt-in statements. They often rely on loose and coded terminology. So things like community led or community governed, which can be interpreted in different ways. And they are attempting to, to differentiate between academic values based uh, publishing activities and profit driven publishing activities. And in so doing, they set up a false dichotomy sometimes between commercial and nonprofit that I'd love to talk to anybody about at another time. Um, another thing to note is that these documents haven't been issued by standards making bodies. For the most part, they've come out of events or a set of participants in a community or an association or a project. And compliance with these documents has been both voluntary and entirely unregulated. So you can sign on to any set of principles and you can work in direct conflict with those principles and you're not going to have a whole lot of professional repercussions in part because nobody has the time to one by one assess whether you are actually living up to what you say that you are living up to. Now on the very positive side, there's a good degree of consistency. Part of what we found in these values and principle statements is that that consistency is there in terms of what's important across these statements. And while very few of those statements currently provide ways to assess or optimize or demonstrate alignment with these values, there are maturing models in other fields that we can learn from. So where's the consistency? Um, 2020 to 2022, Sarah Lippincott and I spent time identifying and defining these further uh, based on Sarah Whipperman and Maya's work. And we've edited our outputs with open peer review on PubPub's Commonplace, thank you PubPub, um, and we've refined them according to feedback and input. And we identified six values or value areas that are most commonly cited across the various models and frameworks and manifestos. So financial and organizational sustainability, openness, representative governance, equity, accessibility, and anti-oppression, sharing of knowledge and transparency are the six that we focus on. And identifying these values and defining them has been one major step in our work. But the other has been to think about how to use these to actually bring about transformation within the sector. Having the values, we've had that since the 1990s. How do we incentivize folks not just to claim these values, but to truly strive to enact them? And for that, we turn to assessment models that are used in adjacent fields. So the five that are listed here are a subset that we found particularly valuable for thinking about what form and format of assessment might best be suited for our own field. Some of these require enormous amounts of work from the entity that's being assessed. And as we tried to parse out, because we can't do that, like the barriers to entry, there are all kinds of problems that this would present. So we tried to parse out what are some of the factors that make some of these frameworks arduous and some of these frameworks a little bit easier to work with. And one of the things that we saw is that there are lots of yes, no questions and indications in the ones that are really arduous. And there's more of a spectrum approach in the ones that are less arduous and more just helpful and pointing in positive directions and things like that. So we have tried to embody that in what we are doing at this point with the forest framework. So the research and community feedback that we had gave us the grounding to build the forest framework, um, which we published earlier this year. And what the forest framework does is it takes that distilled set of values, defines principles associated with them, which again are distilled out of lots and lots, and lots of approaches to this. Um, and then it offers concrete mechanisms that communities can use to assess how these policies or, or how their policies and practices actually align with these values and with their associated principles. So the framework has been designed not as a, a judgmental kind of tool, but really to recognize growth and progress, not just results, um, to identify strengths and point to possible strengths rather than just pointing to deficits and centering aspirations and really encouraging folks to be moving always on that spectrum towards the higher end of the manifestation of these values. So as we did this, we tried to account for differences in organizational maturity and mission and recognize that you know, the forest uh, framework as it stands right now is imperfect. It, it is a first try, but it's an accountability uh, space that is trying to st strike this balance between having enough structure and information that we can really engender trust and guide investments and incentivize alignment with these shared values but not be so rigid that it creates artificial barriers to entry into the marketplace. 
So this is just a slide that shows you the kind of components of the forest framework. Um, when you go into the forest framework, what it does is it gives you this for each one of the F-O-R-E-S-T, T being transparency and being the one that I chose for today, it gives you a quick overview of what are the principles that undergird that value, so that value of transparency. And so here, you know, T1 is offer full and honest accounting of business identity and governance structure, being open and honest about this. Are you fiscally hosted? Are you not? If you are, who buy? Are you a nonprofit? Are you a for-profit? Just putting that information out there, not as a judgment call, but just putting that information out there is important. So from transparency, you then go into these ABC that are the next line over. Those are the indicators that give you some ways of evidencing, not the only ways, but some ways of evidencing that you are, you are in compliance with or uh, in alignment with that principle. We also have in this packet of the forest framework, um, these things that we call cards, and you can see the spectrum here, you know, not planning, considering, in progress, implemented. Um, for each one of those ABC kind of indicators, we go into more detail. What are some of the very specific evidence types that you might use? So disclosing funding sources and conflict of interest, having an inventory of your funding sources available might be a good way to do that. And then finally, we've got a reflection section because above all, this is meant right now as a tool that can help groups think through what values do we espouse and how are we showing them or not showing them in our actions. And so we've got a set of questions that are meant to, to have a transformative effect internally on an organization. You bring your people together, you talk about this and automatically you find places where you want to get better. And so we just wrapped a pilot and had our debrief with our cohort that used this last week. And I'm really pleased to say that overall, the entire group talked about how surprised they were by the quality of conversations that their teams had, um, including teams where it was like, you know, the HR person, as well as the editor in chief, as well as the development person, as well as the IT person. And then even when people were coming from very different parts of the org, those conversations really gelled and people got a lot out of it, including ideas on how to get better. So that is what I had for you today, just setting up the rest of these panelists who are all trying to evidence their own work in values-based uh, publishing. So I'll stop there. I believe Carrie is muted and she needs to introduce the next speaker. Sorry. Thank, thank you, Catherine. Yes, I was, I was in a mute cycle. Um, Abel, please go ahead and start your presentation. Thank you. And thank you, thank Catherine. You. Thank you very much for this invitation uh, to this incredible conference. Congratulations to WASPA. Uh, the committee and the organizer. I will share with you uh, the values uh, underlying the trajectory of the Cielo from open access to open science. Uh, so I, I will share uh, four lines. One is the fact that Cielo is uh, an open science infrastructure program and an international technical cooperation program. This is the sense of Cielo uh, development. It accumulates uh, 25 years of sustainable development from open access to open science. We started to move to open science from uh, 2018. Uh, it is centering on the maximization of the visibility and the impact of uh, the researches uh, that is communicated through Cielo journals. And uh, we are fully committed to the continuous improvement of the diversity, equity, inclusion, and the accessibility. I will go through these uh, lines uh, very fast. Uh, so uh, 
the program aim is at the development of the capacity and knowledge on the management of the web-based library of research communication objects. Uh, in August 2022, we have five types of uh, research object uh, uh, collections, you know, libraries. Cielo Preprint since 2020, Cielo Network for 25 years, covering 17 countries now, uh, Cielo Data, which is a repository with dataverse technology, uh, Cielo Books, from which is celebrated 10 years this year. Uh, Cielo Print is used the uh, open preprint system from PKP. Uh, we are also improving uh, transparency of the, the process of, of the uh, production of, of the articles and, and the data and so on. Uh, version uh, or, or, or the, the final version of the article, version of the report, we are asking uh, journals to include the editor name responsible for the peer review, uh, the uh, data statement or the data is where we can access it and the progressivity review report. And also offer as options uh, the opening of identities. In Cielo Preprint, we start following uh, as a bio initiatives to experiment with pre review. Uh, is, is very nice, but, but of course, we needed to get momentum and also using hypothesis feedback. The principles are scientific knowledge as a national and global public good, network centered operation at all levels. Cielo is probably a unique solution uh, where we work with fully decentralization of operation, uh, policies and uh, financial standards, best practice, innovation, principles, diversity, equity, uh, inclusion, and uh, um, accessibility principles. Uh, in terms of uh, the trajectory, we have a model uh, in which each collection start to develop the full collection and the adopt the fully uh, web libraries principle or, or, or characteristic, which is uh, this intermediation, universalization, virtualization, which is or which are the basic for open science uh, operation. So we start with pilot project 25 years ago, we went into for collection, then web-based library, and now we are moving to open science. And the idea is to fully have all the schools and, and, and the operation by 2023. Uh, we have two basic documents <laughs> or, 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 or documentation, which is the indexing criteria and the priority lines of action. In each country, there is a national advisory board. And in the case of Brazil, we work with triennial projects with grants from government agencies led by FAPESP, State of Sao Paulo Research Foundation. But each country has a different model. And we are now celebrating 25 years next year, September, last week of September, you all are invited. Uh, then uh, we have a maximization of uh, impact and visibility. I bring this table, which is evolution of five years of the site score indicator, which work with the average of impact uh, every four years. For all scope journals, uh, uh, Cielo journals in Scopus and the all Cielo journals, uh, uh, we did uh, a correlation to get the values. And we have, in the case of the Cielo, an, uh, an average annual uh, growth rate, which is greater than uh, the, the scope, which, which is okay for us and uh, is uh, evidence that, that we are achieving this goal. And finally, improvement of diversity, equity, inclusion, and the accessibility. We are uh, present in 17 countries, so we bring, is a decentralized, so we bring all the uh, rich 
experiences of, of, of this country. We have it, uh, many symmetries in the asymmetries uh, which enrich the system. Uh, we work with all the thematic areas. You know? e, e, we have it predominantly journals on social science and humanities. Uh, in most of the, 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 the geographic region I select here, but when we go to articles, we have life science in first place because uh, social science publishing less article uh, per journal. But this is very well uh, established structure uh, for Latin American Caribbean, for Brazil, which, which has a different development. Um, and uh, uh, then uh, we have uh, uh, the multilingualism, which is ubiquitous in, in, in Cielo from the very beginning. Uh, so all articles we have today, 50% of the English, but when you go to Latin America, uh, without Brazil, we have a, 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 only 23% in English, predominantly Spanish. No? When you go to South Africa, of course, we have predominantly English, but English is present mainly in life science in all uh, situations. Uh, and they, of course, when you go to social science and humanities, uh, uh, the presence of, of English is, 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 is over. Uh, then uh, we have the indexing criteria, which you try to put together is, is about uh, uh, 20 pages that, that put together all these values and the objectives and, and the assumptions. And also we have been developing uh, CLO design system, uh, basically to encompass uh, the issues related to accessibility, not only to read, course, but also progressively to enrich the uh, article, you know, the XML, with elements related to uh, improve accessibility. So this is what I wanted to share with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Abel. Uh, our next speaker, Anne. Uh, Abel, could you unscrew your, unshare your screen? Thank you. Okay, hi there. Just a moment, I am trying to do that. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, good. Everyone can see here. Take it. Okay, hi. Thanks uh, for inviting me to this uh, panel. It's my first OASPA, and it's been my head is swirling with all the information and, and things I've learned. Um, so, uh, unlike some of the other organizations, I'm going to be talking about a very newly emergent organization called, or initiative called Cooperate for Open, which is a new community of practice um, kickstarted by Libraria. And if you don't know who Libraria is, they are a collective of researchers that got started in 2015 to help convene and form conversations and demonstrate projects um, that would support a more open, diverse, community-controlled scholarly communication system. And Libraria works in different areas. The first is Subscribe to Open, which we heard a little bit about yesterday. They've worked with Bergan in flipping uh, their journals to OA. They've worked with uh, scholarly societies, pr primarily in anthropology, but related fields on um, advocating a transition to OA. And then finally, instead of focusing on just flipping OA, uh, um, paywall to OA, they, they also have this Cooperate for Open initiative about uh, supporting small born OA publications. So C4O, as we affectionately call ourselves, uh, is um, the challenge here with this group is basically to ensure the ongoing survival of these small scholar-led journals um, who are doing really vibrant and creative and experimental work, sometimes pushing the boundaries of what open scholarship can be, but who, whose existence is extremely precarious. These are the marginal of the marginal. Uh, many of them uh, exist because of in-kind support from libraries at their institutions and no budget after that, completely voluntary labor. 
So the model to support these is basically to create a mutual aid network uh, and it allows them to come together to share their resources, not necessarily to scale up and become more professional, but basically to allow their existence into the future and to do that on their terms, preserving their autonomy and integrity in the process. And I'm so sorry to interrupt you. Uh, yeah. We're getting a couple of comments about your, your slides are not in, um, they're in a mode where we can see all of your slides and your oh. um, presenter mode, right? Yes. Uh huh. Okay. I'm sorry to interrupt. I know I don't want no, to. No, no, that's that. fine. Um, I don't know how to do presenter mode without it. Okay, let me just see. Slideshow. How do I do it? Is that better? Perfect, thank you. Of course, now I can't see my notes, but I'll just make up as I go along anyway. Um, uh, so we're right now, um, so what Libraria did was look at this group and say, okay, there's different scales of, of publishing that may require different OA models. And um, so they wanted to particularly look at this sector, which stood outside of the kind of traditional mainstream funding models and sort of sat precariously alongside them. And they wanted to figure out how they could support these groups. So they undertook a feasibility study, which Kate Herman uh, did in late October, or late 2020, early 2021. And uh, they were looking at including um, journals that were born OA, diamond OA only, no transformative agreement, uh, agreements or fees involved. Uh, completely scholar-led, that meaning scholars as primary decision makers, and largely housed in anthropology and related fields. And out of hundreds of, of um, people, journals uh, they reached out to, 53 responded to the survey, and then 16 individuals representing 17 journals took place in five Zoom workshops in early 2020. And what what they found was that even though this, this cohort was extremely diverse in some ways, they actually did share common values and that that, that could be, become the basis for sort of building a community of practice here. And those values included um, a, a vehement uh, um, necessity to be a diamond OA, no, no reader, no author fees. Um, they were that they supported independent fiercely independent, I might say, community scholar-driven uh, publishing as opposed to commercial or professional-driven publishing. They all were committed to ethical production of their scholarship in terms of labor practices, peer review, et cetera. They were not interested in, in being extractive uh, in any way, shape, or form. I'm sure nobody is, but they were uh, very direct about wanting to support that. Um, they embrace a cooperative and a collaborative ethic as opposed to a competitive ethic that feeds into that prestige economy. Many of them are uh, wanting to be experimental, deliberately experimental, pushing at the boundaries of their disciplines and scholarly publishing. They don't necessarily want to uphold, uphold the status quo. Uh, many of them are also uh, very concerned about growing too fast. Uh, and, and so they're wanting to remain relatively small and taking a slower approach to their publishing. And finally, they're wanting to uh, reconfigure what impact means as many other, other uh, publishing initiatives are trying to do now. They're wanting to get beyond impact factors and readership numbers and look at um, how they're, they're having an effect just in terms of the values they hold in their publishing. Um, so beyond the sharing values, they also shared very similar concerns. I mean, these are uh, financially precarious journals, uh, and so that some of them are negotiating month to month, year to year, and trying to figure out a more sustainable model for that. Their, their, one, their issue of editorial succession is ongoing. Some of these are very small with one or two people running them, and they're finding somebody to take it on in the future is, is sometimes a, a big challenge. Um, uh, Journal preservation is ongoing. We know there's a high rate of online journals that just disappear after a while. And so that's, that's an issue here as well. Discoverability indexing are ongoing challenges. Uh, in, fact, in fact, some of the journals in this group are not listed with DOAJ and don't even meet the criteria for that. Uh, one or two may have issues with some of the criteria themselves. So, um, and then a bunch are, on, are listed with DOAJ, but 
still have indexing and discoverability issues. Um, the concerns around labor practices, as I mentioned, wanting to be fair, treat uh, precarious labor ethically, especially when they have no budget. Same with peer review, uh, finding the time to, to undertake peer review processes that feel uh, like they meet their mission of being open and caring and collaborative. Um, many want to publish in more than one language, but uh, have very limited resources to do so. Uh, and many are embracing multimodal scholarship, but again, uh, the learning curve, the resources required are a real challenge for this group at this level. And everyone's concerned with being more transparent about how their journal and their, their editorial collectives run. So coming out of the report, uh, Kate identified four kind of key areas in which uh, resources could be shared. I mean, they're pretty obvious. They're sharing knowledge, uh, sharing infrastructure, uh, toolkits, platforms, sharing labor, including creating databases of you know, uh, freelancing uh, or a database of peer reviewers. And then although some were interested in, in shared funding, many were uh, more interested in shared costing at this point. But what they found was that before you could actually uh, develop programs to help the, the concrete sharing of all these resources, they needed to have a stronger set of horizontal connections amongst them, a community, if you will. Uh, and so the next phase, which we are currently in, is the building of a community of practice. So that's why this is a very new group. And it started in May. And I, I started in May, and I'm here till November, and madly trying to help kickstart this in a way that there'll be something left after I leave. But so who are we right now? We're about 30 plus scholar-led Diamond OA journals, no libraries involved at this point. Um, there may be down the line. Um, uh, there is no formal membership criteria it's, it's, or level of participation at this point. Again, trying to not put up too many barriers to starting this community. That will probably change down the line. Um, we're mostly in anthropology and social sciences. We're located in, these journals are located in Europe, North America, Australasia, and then a few outlying areas uh, as well, Japan, Brazil. Um, and uh, the priorities for the journals vary as well. They're everything from scholarly society publications to those that really are focused on engaging the public to those that are like really niche magazine-like journals that are trying to uh, experiment and push the edges of things. Um, how are we going to build a community? Well, so far we've been rearticulating the values of the, of the um, feasibility study. In July, we uh, jump started a discussion platform on Mattermost, organized around the key challenges so people could partake in the discussions they wanted to, and it was just not a free for all. We're having monthly Zoom meetings with experts, um, everything from the Diamond OA action plan and whether we should be involved to OJS technicalities. And hopefully that'll be ongoing for months to come beyond my existence. Um, we're sending regular newsletters to catch the people who aren't quite yet involved in the other areas is on a regular basis. And most excitingly, there's a subgroup that's sort of in the process of trying to articulate a values-based sort of C4O, certification or seal of approval, if you will. Um, that's in the very early stages. They were going to do a poster at this conference, but the timing didn't work. So we'll continue on with that in the next couple of months and hopefully be able to get some concrete pro uh, pro progress going that way. How do we know whether we've built a community at the end of this? Well, we're going to have to sit and talk about uh, how vibrantly engaged the discussion is on Mattermost and uh, go from there, I guess, if it if there is no engagement, I'm not sure this community of practice will continue. Um, uh, we want to see whether there are concrete steps taken towards developing this values-based C4O seal. I think that could be a really concrete project to build on that people can get involved in and move forward with. We'll also look at whether there's interest in moving to a level of sharing a, 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 a public-facing platform together. And then we'll look at tentative interest in creating a more formal cooperative structure down the line. Um, that's basically it. As I say, it's very new. Um, we'll, we'll see how we're going, but um, uh, it's an exciting development to start anyway. Thanks. Thanks so much, Anne. Um, next up is Joe DeVille. Thanks so much. Uh, that was really interesting. Uh, okay.
Okay, I'm hoping that you can see my slides. If not, um, please let me know. So yeah, hi, uh, I'm Joe Deville, and today I'm going to be talking about some work that I and my colleagues have been doing in uh, founding an organisation called the Open Book Collective, and as part of that, talk about the challenge of reconfiguring value and values in open uh, book publishing. But I want to sort of begin with a bit of a tangent and with a story from my own discipline. So I'm a sociologist and specifically an economic sociologist. And I want to talk um, briefly about uh, this guy on the, on the left here, who's actually a, a quite problematic and somewhat controversial figure, which is uh, Talcott Parsons. And um, uh, at a moment in, in the history of my discipline uh, involving him, where he um, sought, well, at that point in, in his career, he was quite interested in specifying the terrain uh, of sociology as a discipline. Um, and in many, in many respects had kind of imperialist ambitions. He was uh, saw sociology in some ways as a kind of master discipline, but there was one discipline that he didn't feel that sociology was equipped to take on and that was um, economics. And so there's this somewhat apocryphal story that he made a pact that may or may, or may not have involved him walking down his corridor um, at Harvard to speak to his fellow colleagues in economics. Um, and to, to divide up the terrain um, of, of study um, and to assign economics uh, as a discipline that can deal with uh, the financial relations of life and um, what he called the economic element of life um, or value, and that sociology should deal with uh, the values um, of life, what he called the value attitudes of the community. Um, why do I mention this? Well, the reason I mention this is actually because as an economic sociologist, I and my colleagues have repeatedly argued that this kind of view of the world where you have these two separate domains is often empirically entirely um, unsustainable. Um, value relations are always deeply involved in and entangled with, with values relationships. And we also have these two sort of um, parts of life continually informing one another. Okay, so that's a kind of sociological story, but I think this is obviously also important for open access as we repeatedly uh, have these arguments being mixed together. Values arguments such as, for example, that academic knowledge should be freely available to all, mixing with value um, arguments such as, for example, that publishers shouldn't profit from the labour um, of academics. And so I'm particularly interested in open access book publishing. And when we look across the field of book publishing, as it will be with journal publishing, we can see that publishing necessitates daily practical ongoing reconfigurations of these relations between values and value, um, all the way from the kind of scholar-led publishers that I represent, which is partly why I was so interested in the previous presentation, all the way to the uh, more explicitly value-driven uh, practices of large commercial presses with a number of presses in between, and here we just have some examples of that. But we can also see that this also relates to the building of open access infrastructures. Here are some of those uh, in the books publishing space. Again, all um, involved in, in, you know, inevitably involved in the reconfiguration of values and value relationships. And, and I'm going to talk about how that relates to our work with the Open Book Collective, which is the institution, uh, the organization represented top left. So the first thing to say is the Open Book Collective is an organization. Uh, it's a not for profit incorporated in the UK. We legally exist um, and we're in the, in the, on the road to becoming a charity uh, in the UK. And we've been building this organization funded um, by researching the Demi Arcadia Fund as part of the COPIM project for uh, the past uh, few years. Um, and throughout that process, we've been thinking a lot about how these value relations intersect uh, and potentially uh, overlap with um, values relations. So first of all, I just wanted to talk about, I guess, what has been our main area of activity uh, in the project, which is building a new digital platform. Um, and it's a new digital platform that we hope will address some of the challenges of open access book publishing, particularly around the funding of um, OAE books from smaller and, and medium sized publishers. Um, so what this platform, the reason it's involved in the configuration of value is primarily because this platform is, a, is designed to act as a financial intermediary. And the reason it acts as a financial intermediary is to generate new revenue streams, new revenue streams for open access book publishers, uh, and as well for open access service providers. So these are infrastructure um, providers that um, um, publishing often depends upon. Um, we're also interested in supporting a model of open access publishing not reliant on book processing charges. So I'm very interested to hear the next presentation. Um, but we also want to sort of configure the value relations of open access book publishing that at the moment tend to uh, often rely on the charging of, of BPCs, often at very, very high rates. 
We also want to make it easier for librarians to and those working in libraries to support open access membership schemes. And I'll come on to those uh, in a second. But all these kind of reconfiguration of value uh, relations also are deeply sort of tied to the, uh, to the reconfigurations of, of, uh, of values. So we think that these two things are kind of inseparable from one another, or at least they should be seen as inseparable and we should make that explicit. So alongside, for example, acting as a financial intermediary, we're also trying to build a community, a new community of publishers, service providers, and librarians working together to solve some of the challenges of open book publishing. Committed to supporting bibliodiversity, books in different languages, books from, uh, of different sizes, different forms of uh, experimental publishing, for example. Committed to making infrastructures open and also to working as a not-for-profit. So I mentioned membership um, program, library membership programs, and here are four library membership programs. Um, the first two are uh, library membership programs offered by publishers. Um, these are both publishers involved in my project, Punctum Books uh, and Open Book Publishers. They have an existing library membership program that has been successful in both cases. And what this involves is them as a publisher going to a library and saying, will you financially support us as an organization, effectively based on our past track record? Because it's important to note here that these are diamond open access publishers. So their texts are fully available uh, on an open access basis. So the library is paying for access to content, but it is being asked to support them as an organization. And we see a number of other um, library membership type models in the space. Opening the future is something else my project has been involved with. And we also have library membership programs being offered by, for example, infrastructure um, providers. And what we've been trying to do, well, I guess one of the, so this is a, a different model for funding open access book publishing and infrastructure provision, um, different from the from BPCs. Um, but we can imagine there might be some challenges in scaling this model. If every publisher had, to, had a library membership program and every publisher was then approaching a library for funding, we could imagine that libraries would quickly become overwhelmed. And this is partly where our, um, platform comes in, the Open Book Collective platform. And I'm just going to take you straight into the heart of that platform, into the area that is probably of most interest to those working in libraries, which is where they um, start to build a quotation for supporting not just one uh, library membership program, but more than one. And here we see some indicative um, content, including um, some of the scholar-led publishers that um, are involved in the uh, project. So the library, the, the library um, colleague can support an individual library membership program, or even a collective of different um, programs together. What are the advantages of this for libraries and institutions? Well, first of all, it acts to aggregate different uh, offerings, uh, makes it far easier for them, for, a, for those working in libraries to understand different offerings um, via sort of standardized sets of information, much easier for them to understand the relevance of these offerings to them and to their students, their research staff and so on. And we also conduct due diligence of those participating in the platform to make sure that they meet the standards that a library would expect them to meet. And we also simplify the work process, the workflow process by offering, for example, a single procurement process and consolidated contracts and so on. And for publishers and service providers, again, we have kind of workflow benefits. So we manage the invoicing process, contracting process managing payment flows and so on. And why this is so important is actually because it makes offering membership programs possible for even small publishers. And then for those really small publishers, we then bundle those together into a collective offering. One of the most kind of, you know, uh, labor intensive work part of the work we do is outreach. So undertaking outreach on behalf of our publishers and service providers um, to uh, solicit um, income from libraries. And we hope that this will not only reduce uh, publishers' reliance on BPCs, helping them transition away from this model that we think is problematic in lots of different ways, but also uh, bringing in new funds to support um, open infrastructures. Taking you further through the platform here, a few other points to note. Running costs are shared between publishers and service providers on the one hand and libraries on the other. Um, uh, everyone with a financial stake in the platform can become involved in governance. Publishers and service providers also contribute to a collective fund. This is a grant giving fund that anybody in OA book publishing can apply to to, to build um, capacity, as long as it's in line with the values of the Open Book Collective. Um, and of course, all financial information and fees and so on are reported openly and transparently. And I should emphasize that we're a not-for-profit. And I suppose I just wanted to end sort of, you know, with a, the, perhaps a prompt to us all. I think, you know, um, by no means is, is this the, the solution to open book publishing or even the problem of financing open book publishing. So I would really encourage us all to see if we can work together to imagine 
uh, more radical uh, reconfigurations of the value and values relations um, surrounding open books. Um, we're launching later this year. If you want to follow us, we're on Open Book Collect uh, on Twitter, and there is a link to our mailing list. I'll also post a link to a blog post where we posted more about our governance um, framework and our membership criteria. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, Francois? Over to you. Right, let me just try and share my screen. Okay, that all good? I'm still seeing you. Oh, mm, okay. No, it's not. Why is it not sharing my screen? Okay, all right, let me just go out of that. Trying to share both screens, I think, which is the problem. Okay, Still no sharing. Still can see you. Uh, it's showing up both screens for some reason. Let me just turn off this other screen and see what happens. Um, There you go. Uh, what can you see now? Now I can see your desktop. Oh, okay, so let me just open up uh, PowerPoint again. I just close PowerPoint. Let's go to... You're in presenter mode, so if you could switch to yes. Yeah, let me just see if I can switch it around. Is that good now? Perfect, thank you. Yeah. Sorry about that. So we've got it all lined up. We have uh, something called load shedding here, which means that my face is probably bright because I'm lit up by the phone. There's no power to my laptop will last. But uh, thank you very much for the the opportunity. And like Anne, it's my first uh, ask us. I'm excited to join. I'll be enjoying the, enjoying the conversations. And uh, like Julian, I'm going to be focusing mainly on uh, on books rather than on uh, than on journals. I think my, my starting point is probably things that I've that I've noticed uh, over the past three days, and maybe that's the advantage of being the last speaker on the last day, is one, there seems to be a, a general negative perception of uh, of BPCs, although there is also an acknowledgement that there are multiple multiple models that seems to come to through fairly consistently. Um, and given that we are a BPC-based uh, publisher, that's uh, hence the, the word defense in the, in the title. I think the second thing is that there's a, a general lack of recognition of uh, how contextual factors affect uh, publishing strategies and, and models. And I mean, it's a pet peeve of mine, so you know, forgive me for uh, ranting a little bit, but you know, I can count on my on both hands how often people have said it's uh, 
summer or spring or fall, um, when actually um, the seasons here are the opposite of whatever people are referring to uh, in the north. And I would suggest that people that live on the equator probably have even a less idea of, of those seasons. And for me, that just indicates a lack of uh, understanding or of, of the different contexts in which we all operate. And today, that's what I want to show you is how different the context is here in, in South Africa. And then the third thing is bringing the values and norms of science and publishers closer together is what I think really the, the aim is, you know, regardless of the of the, the publishing model that, that we speak to. And, uh, and when I was introduced, uh, the term was used for the expression that models are, are drowning out, out values. And I feel like that sometimes as a publisher, there's so many models and so many options, but so little talk about, about values and not just values between us as publishers, um, but the values that are shared between us and the scientific community that we should be working with and, and I, I would argue for. So I'm going to focus on, on values and in particular return to values and a suggestion that a preoccupation with open access models drowns out the values that I think should open open access monograph uh, publishing. I'm going to refer to the case of African Minds. It's a publisher that, that's, that I started in about 2012. Um, and it's one that I know well. Um, and I think it is different in, in some respects, and it's and it's fairly unique because there aren't many open access publishers in, in Africa, although they are growing and they're growing mainly from, from within uh, university libraries. So African Minds has adopted a book processing charge model, and I'll set out the reasons for this in the presentation. And I'm going to suggest that this model does not necessarily imply that African Minds is, is not driven by a core set of values that are closely aligned with those of science. And I think that's the, the important thing. So I can't really explain our model without referring to what our own national research funding landscape looks like. And so I put together this little thematic to try and explain this uh, to those who are unfamiliar with it. And I apologize to those who may be on the on the call from, from South Africa because they'll be you know very familiar with this with this with this particular model. But if we start with what is supposed to be uh, an academic, the best I could find, um, the way it works in, in South Africa, and by the way, there were just over 55,000 uh, full-time academics in the system in 2019. When they produce a publication, um, these publications on an annual basis are submitted to the university, uh, typically uh, organizational unit within the university called the research office that will then evaluate those uh, publications and then in turn submit those to the Department of Higher Education and Training. The acronym is here DHET, which is a government uh, ministry or department within a government ministry. Now there's a policy in South Africa that says for each publication that you produce, there'll be a financial reward for that publication. Now that financial reward um, is paid to the institution rather than directly back to the academic that produced that, that publication. And to put this in more sort of quantitative terms, um, it all works on units, um, not on publication, well, which are linked to publication types. So a journal article counts for one unit. Of course, if it's co-authored, then it's fra fractionalized. So if there are two authors, you get half a unit. Uh, any monograph counts 10 units. So the bureaucracy has decided that one book is 10 times the effort of one journal article. By the way, it used to be five, and was up, updated to 10 fairly recently. And any conference proceeding or conference paper is worth 0.5 units. Now, the total pie funding that's available from uh, the government is what I worked out to be about 177 million uh, euros per annum. And that pie then gets divided up according to the submissions uh, that are received by the department. So the actual units vary uh, from year to year, but it only tends to vary fractionally. At the moment, one unit uh, equals about 7,500 euros. So for put in simple terms, if an uh, author produces one article and it's accredited, there is an accreditation and value con uh, quality control process, the, it, 
his or her university will receive the equivalent of seven and a half thousand. Now, what the university does with that money is completely up to the university. The government does not intervene in how that money is distributed at an institutional level. And this might be changing um, beyond the topic of, of, of this talk. Obviously, a lot of gaming of the system that's been introduced because of the system, um, and the government is concerned about that and, and may start to place more controls on how the institution can submit uh, or redisperse that funding at the institutional level. But as I illustrated here, the distribution of funds can vary from nothing to the back to the researcher to 60% to the researcher. In some cases, to, to the researcher's pocket, so it's a cash payment. Um, in other cases, it goes into the research fund and can only be used for research purposes like attending a conference or hiring a research assistant. So why is all of this relevant? Well, it means that there is a public funder um, that potentially supports uh, publishing, both journal publishers and book publishers. The problem that we face at the moment is that very little of that money trickles back <laughs> to, to the publishers. There's, we have no direct relationship with the universities. Um, our relationship as publishers is, is with the academics, who at least in some cases have research funds available and can use those research funds uh, to, to pay book processing charges. And that's why we have a book processing charge model. And it's a virtuous, semi-virtuous cycle because if they pay us to produce a book and that book meets certain quality criteria, it'll move through the process and some of the subsidy for that book will then flow back to the, to the university and potentially to, to the researcher. So in our context, a book processing charge model makes sense because of the system that exists. We are simply tapping into the system. That doesn't mean that we don't have certain values and uh, in terms of what we publish, how we publish, how we interact with authors, all those things are, are on top of the, the, the existing model that, uh, that we've designed given the local, the local context. Now we've had some interesting conversations and, and Joe just presented his, um, uh, the model that they're working on. Um, you know, one of their criteria is you know, that they would like publishers not to be uh, uh, charge book processing charges. And, and we understand that and we've explained that this is our model and it, it works and they've been sympathetic. And of course our response is also, if uh, we can uh, benefit from the OBC model, in other words, that libraries start to support um, us, then we can reduce the number um, of books that attract uh, BBCs. And to some extent, that's already true. I mean, we don't charge BBCs for all books. And here's an example. Um, on the left is a book um, that we charge BPCs, and our BPCs range from a thousand euros to fifteen thousand euros. All depends on the book. We don't see all books as, as as being equal when it comes to production, at least. And so the costs are variable, and we negotiate those costs on a case by case basis. Sometimes we we subsidise some of the costs. In other cases, they're fully covered. Um, but it also means that there's some books that we charge uh, no BBCs for, and the book on the right is an example of that. And this is particularly important for us, for authors from, from universities in Africa um, that are outside of our system that don't have access to, to funds uh, for, their, for their publications. So in that sense, we have a bit of a hybrid model, and there's a little bit of diamond um, and some BBCs mixed, uh, mixed in. Just for interest, we did... Um, uh, with Lucy from uh, Open Book Publishers recently uh, wrote up about 10 case studies of different open access models and, and this link will take you to those and you can read all of them and, and, and just see the differences um, that exist at the moment between uh, different approaches. One thing about our particular model that I, I want to highlight and, and I think it is taking off and uh, may use people earlier on but I think especially with the scholar-led publishers, we see uh, eye to eye on this, is that you know, in the old models, you carved up territories and sold books within those territories, you know, territories were, were protected. Of course, when things are open access and digital, uh, those territories don't really make sense anymore. They're impossible to demarcate and, and, and defend and control. So our strategy with, with uh, open access books 
is to co-publish where we can. And you might say, well, what's the point if everything's theoretically available um, online? Well, that's true, but it's also true that we all have access to different networks. We don't all um, have a central position or prominent position in, in all networks. So by co-publishing with other publishers, we feel that we can expand the reach of our books um, by tapping into different networks. So on the left, you see a book that is just about to come out with Liverpool University Press. Uh, the book was with De Gruyter, and uh, the one in French was with a, with a small publisher called Halfa. I can also say that the experience is working with different publishers is also teaching us quite a lot. Um, I won't go into too much detail, but it's much harder working with De Gruyter than it is with Liverpool University Press. So that takes us to models versus versus values. Um, and we think that you start with the values and then develop the models. And that in turn depends on the context. And I've kind of made that point uh, already, uh, repeating myself. It does make you think about certain things. You know, do you think about sales? Do you think about access? Our sales are irrelevant. Um, and this is something that's very hard for our authors to understand. Um, it means if they've paid BPCs and we often include the cost of printing some books in those in those BPCs. It means that when they have a seminar or a launch or uh, whatever event it may be, we have books available for free to to hand out while our competing publishers are there with their credit card machines trying to sell to sell books. And so we believe that that makes the books more accessible in a way that uh, another model may uh, may not. Especially when the books in South Africa at least cost hundred are hardback and cost a hundred pounds. Um, that's really unaffordable for any student, um, let alone uh, certain lecturers and, and professors. Other things to think about are scale versus collaboration. I mean, for us, we don't want to scale. And I think we share this um, with some of the scholar-led publishers. We want, we're want happy to stay small um, and collaborate uh, with other publishers in order to achieve some kind of scale. And again, I think that links well with the previous presentation. Um, collaboration for us is more important than, um, than scaling. Equally, volume versus quality. For us, volume is not so important, whether that's the number of books disseminated or, or sold or downloaded. Um, what's important is the quality. And when I talk about quality, I mean both the quality of the service. So the relationship that we have with our, our authors is really important. There's rapid communication. There's a close relationship. And someone mentioned earlier, you know, it would be interesting to study the difference between, um, you know, the values, or let's call them the, the logics of, you know, the editorial team versus the marketing or sales or legal team. Um, and I think that's something that we don't, we don't struggle with because, um, we can protect and hold our relationships quite quite closely because we're small and build up trust relationships with our with our authors that may be more difficult in, in other contexts. And the same applies to our products. We take time, um, although you know our books come out fairly quickly. That also is a, a value add because we're not so big. Um, we can get uh, you know the ten or twelve books that we produce a year um, will take us you know anywhere from one to four months to produce. The big factor being the peer review process, which is by far the longest uh, process in um, in the production in the production line. I should add, um, as Joe did, as a side note, that we are not for profit publishers. So um, any uh, okay. that is generated from sales or, or otherwise is is re um, invested into into the business. Nearly done. The last slide is really just to highlight. Um, Again, a sociological perspective, um, and particularly that of Robert Merton, who was a so sociologist of science, uh, who introduced these norms post the war, which is an interesting time because that's when you know, massification of higher education really took off and, and publish, publishers became more, more marketable. Yeah. He identifies four norms, um, and one of those is communalism. It was called communism, but changed to communalism for obvious reasons. He says, and it states that the results and discoveries are not the individual researcher, but belong 
to the scientific community and to society at large. And we heard a lot about that on the first day, you know, the science society uh, relationship. So results and discoveries did not belong to publishers. Um, and this highlights the connection between science and society. And this does not mean that publishers and other services provider providers don't have an important role to play. Um, but it's perhaps worth asking the questions are whether publishers are in the service of science or are the scientists beholden to, to publishers? And what does this mean for the trust relationship between science uh, and its publishers? And I think initially the open access movement was quite uh, hopeful that by open, this relationship could be restored as per Merton's quote at the bottom about secrecy being the antithesis and full and open communication being the enactment uh, of, of, of the relationship. Um, but as we have seen over time, that's the kind of commercialization of, of open access, I think has set us back in, in that uh, trust relationship. So in, in closing, I would just say that, you know, we hope through our own small efforts and maybe through the efforts of others that we can collaborate with that it'd be possible to restore a healthy and value-driven relationship between publishing and, and the academy and also to avoid any binary and unnuanced classifications of publishers as, as good or bad or good or non-profit really to look at the values that depend uh, the models that they design within their particular uh, particular context. Thank you for your attention. I'm going to leave it there. Thank you so much. And if the rest of the panelists could come back online. Thank you all. I really appreciate um, the diversity of presentations. And um, I'm just going to quote Anne, who said, everything is swirling around from the, from the presentations that we've had uh, pre prior to these and everything that you've said today. And also, Joe, I feel like your model was designed for librarians. So sign me up. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to talk about it. <laughs> um, and also, I really appreciate, Francois, how you uh, talked about giving grace to different models that I think that's the other theme that's come across that everything is everything is sort of uh, local, right? There are local needs or local perspectives and these, these underlying values are really the thing that can bring us together. Um, I guess the thing for me, again, I'm a, I'm a US American, so we're culturally narcissistic. So I'm just gonna ask a, a question about, um, so how, how can, and you've all talked a little bit about this, but when I think about the number of things that come into my email, for example, from publishers, from faculty who are asking for things, how, what do you think the best strategy is for making people aware, as aware of the commercial publisher offerings, you know, to make sure that they're as, that how can we get to the point where it is as ubiquitous and it is as much an uh, immediate thought for authors that, oh yes, I'll do the open book collective or this is how I wanna do that. That, that. that to me is the challenge of someone who's constantly getting bombarded with requests and, and knows about these options or is learning about these options, but telling people what to do is not effective, right? So how do you, how do you think about those strategies? Maybe Catherine, maybe you start. Happy to. Yeah, this is this is what led me in the direction of the forest framework. So I'm coming in with a bias towards something that I've been thinking about for a long time. But it's kind of a little R regulation to go back to the close of the last panel. You know, if and it's not it's not commercial versus nonprofit. There's so many bad nonprofit actors. Let me just tell you, like I can name ones that pay their board members that are active in our field that libraries, should, you know, I mean, it's it's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. It's a tax status. It's not a value statement. Now, being profit motivated is a value statement and being not profit motivated may be a value statement. But we tend to equate the charity with good and the commercial with bad in the same way that Francois was just saying we do with certain models of publishing, you know, book um, processing charges bad, you know, and, and we, we it, it makes things easy when we put things in those spaces, but it's false dichotomies. It doesn't work. It falls apart as soon as you put a sociological lens on it. 
Values though, if we can pinpoint enough detail about what values matter to us, and if we can make those meaningful to the procurement office, then we get change. But there is this pathway from, you know, even with something like the forest framework, which we put tons and tons of energy into, we got lots of feedback on it. And it does start to try to define what are some of those qualities that you really can assess that say, yes, I am following this value and you can see it in these ways. Um, there's still a gap between doing that as a self-assessment or even if we had auditors who were doing that and getting it to the point where it actually influences procurement. So one of the things that I've been paying a lot of attention to is the way that conglomerates milk procurement. So you can look at different fields and the way that like they'll go to the procurement office and, and figure out what they're looking for. Digital preservation is a great space to look at for this. And they'll write the uh, procurement guide for the procurement people that say, here are the standards that you need and put in a bunch of stuff that's absolute malarkey and that privileges that particular corporate entity. Um, and I'm falling into my own false dichotomy by saying corporate entity, but it happens to be that those are the ones that are going for the sales marketing procurement process. What would happen if instead the values piece hit that procurement process? And if from the inside, we tried to make that change. So that's yeah, my two cents, maybe more than two cents in very American sense. <laughs> Sorry. I framed it very Americanly, US Americanly. So Joe, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I suppose um, that one of the things that I guess we are trying to do on the broader coping projects, the Open Book Collective, just kind of one output of this project. So we've got various different other outputs. So there was one actually in one of my slides, Tote, which is the metadata management uh, platform, um, and some of the archiving and preservation work that's being done in the project as well, is we're trying to address some of the various problems of open book publishing. And I suppose what we kind of think and what we would kind of argue is that ultimately in many respects open book publishing uh can deliver con you know scholarly content circulating scholarly content at a, at a higher quality uh and that it's going to have be read more widely it's going to circulate in, com in the community of practice in better ways than uh the, the books that are distributed by large commercial publishers uh, and of course that you know uh, funding uh open access book publishers properly can only help that uh, so that's, I think, really a really important part of it. Um, and yeah, making the publishers sustainable, making them, you know, helping them be able to actually produce high quality metadata to get their books on various different platforms to, uh, and so on. And then I think the second thing is then, yeah, you know, establishing, breaking down those silos between different parts of the academy, between uh, academics, infrastructure providers, those working in libraries and so on. I mean, today I've had a conversation with, you know, the library director at Lancaster, which you know was was really exciting and thinking about how we can work together and that kind of those kind of conversations don't really happen as much as they should and I think if those kind of conversations happen that will as well kind of help break down some of those um, barriers and get library those working libraries or getting scholars talking to those working libraries more because I'm sure libraries are doing a very good job often of trying to reach out to scholars but um, but yeah. And I just also want to say BPCs, I mean, I also represent a small publisher that is 90% reliant on BPCs. And I think would also argue for a values-based BPC publishing model. So yeah, I mean, in that sense, you know, absolutely. And I very much take the point that we need to think about these things contextually, because if we don't, what's the, what's the point? Um, so yeah, if that, if that needs, you know, if, we, if that then needs nuancing, I think that then, then that's important to do. Anyone else want to add anything? Yeah, I'll I'll add just thoughts off the top of my head. Not it's not very well structured, but you know, I remember when we started uh, African Minds, we we thought we'd attract a lot of young um, scholars. You know, we thought that, that there would be a value alignment that they would really buy into open access and, and support us. Of course, the truth was the exact opposite. Uh, the young scholars couldn't because they were on career tracks and had to publish with reputable publishers and the authors that we attracted were the older more established authors um, who didn't care to put it bluntly you know they they'd done what they had to do and they could take the risk so you know i would say one strategy and, and we need to do it we need to do a lot more on this is, is to attract 
those more established scholars with high reputations, and it was, the point was made earlier about the fact that we work in a reputation economy, that if we attract those, those authors, it, it, it has a knock-on effect, effect. If they're willing to publish open access, then that sends a signal to the rest of the, the rest of the academy. So that's something that we try and try and work on. And I'm not to say we write off the, the younger scholars, we, we're more than happy to accommodate them, but we realize the, the reality is that it's very hard for us to compete with Routledge, Oxford, and Cambridge when um, when it comes to um, to to their careers. And then a small thing. I mean, I know you know metrics is getting a bit of a bad rap on, on, on several panels, but it would help us as open access publishers to have metrics that aren't just downloads. And then I, and I get excited, and I see our authors get excited when they see fourteen thousand downloads, and then they think, well, we might have sold two hundred books. So therefore, open access. But we don't know anything about those downloads. We don't know what they mean. We don't know if anyone read the book, used the book, cited the book. Um, book citation data is, is, is moving along, but it's way behind uh, what happens with journals. So some kind of indicators of, of what's actually happening with those books that are made open access would be, would be really, really useful. And I'm sure it'll happen just not there for us at the moment to, well, not for me to make the case uh, with confidence. I'm, I'm not happy just presenting a whole lot of download, uh, download stats um, as evidence of, uh, of anything. And then just the last third point is, is, you know, we need more public funding. And, and that's the point I'm making in our, in our context is we have generous system. Why it came about, I don't know. There's probably a whole history, but, you know, government earmarks a certain amount of money every year for publications, um, we're seeing a huge impact of the philanthropies. You know, with the, the Gates Foundation and, and the like, insisting that things need to be open access. That doesn't kind of protect the smaller publishers, and it doesn't protect um, the values-based open access publishers, because of, because of all open access publishers can benefit from from that. But if we can get the the philanthropies and and governments, easier said than done to also adopt a values-based uh, approach and understand what we're trying to do in terms of values, then maybe we get more, more space to, to participate rather than being crowded out by um, the larger commercial uh, publishers. Thanks. Thank you. Can I, can I just uh, jump in? Please. It's, it's more of a... A struggle that I'm having right now, which is when when um, the you know Joe was talking about this the collective, which is probably where we are headed in many ways, following similar strategies, and we're looking for collective ways in the easiest way possible to be able to make ourselves more visible to libraries and get into their systems. And we definitely are looking at this sort of certification process as one way in which we can market the group of journals that are there to libraries, saying we ad we adhere to these principles. But the problem with the, the frameworks is um, th these are really, that it requires a certain reporting uh, element that is onerous for many of these Diamond OA publishers. And that's part of our struggle is how do we, how do we make them uh, reputable enough to be able to be taken seriously, but still allow them to have that kind of creative feisty edge that they are. And I'm finding that hard balancing even within the group. Um, and a lot of them, you know, they want to do things collectively, but they want to maintain their independence. And so that's an ongoing challenge. And I don't know if anybody else has thoughts on that, but um, yeah, that's where we're at at the moment. And um, I mean, yeah, sorry. Just, I mean, I don't have sort of direct thoughts. I mean, but apart from the fact that you know, both um, Francois and I are involved in Scholar Led, which is this um, advocacy organisation for open access book publishers, and I think it would also be interesting to share notes between these kinds of organisations and you know how the challenges. I mean, I'm not I'm not on the board, um, but um, yeah, the, you know, the challenges of, of doing exactly this kind of work and and establishing and 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 what um, uh, and yeah, and to navigating that tension between collectivization and, and maintaining uh, individual identities and so on. So I think that would be part of the kind of collaborative spirit, I think. 
Absolutely. I mean, I have been in touch with Scholar Led, but you know, uh, still, I thought you still, might have been. I thought we're you still might. trying to figure out, you know, we're we're so early getting off going that it's, you know, I'm not sure what we can do yet, but we certainly have the lines of communication open. Yeah, I appreciate that tension between the I can do this for you and I can support you, right? That if you're very busy and don't have enough people to support you, that I can do this for you is, is like a siren to, to, to move you over there. So I totally appreciate that challenge. Um, we, we only have four minutes left, I believe. Um, and so I'm gonna go to the questions in the, in the Q&A, if you all don't mind. Um, there's a direct question for you, Francois, about if asking if DHET has assigned any number of units to sharing research da data sets. Uh, not yet. Um, so the, there's no incentive for sharing data sets. There are also no incentives for open access, by the way, which is what we, we're pushing for. And this is quite a good time. There are uh revisiting the framework it was introduced in 2005 so they feel that it's time to do that and as i said a lot of that has to do with gaming of the of the system i mean you would be appalled to see some of the the data that you know an academic publishes 80 articles 80 in one year um how that's possible and you know it's almost two a week uh, that's that's just crazy and we see publishing cartels you know people publishing in each other's journals um, or publishing in mul uh, you know, multiple articles in a single issue. There are all these things that are that are creeping in because there's money at stake. Um, so it, that's driving the revision, but it also creates the opportunity to introduce uh, new rewards uh, for things like open research data, maybe a, a bonus for an open access uh, article, et cetera. Okay, it looks like we do have more time. People are asking for more time, including Joe, who's on the panel, so he's a little biased. But uh, so I, I will, um, I will uh, go back to the, uh, um, go back to, uh, I will go back to the Q and A. There's, there's another question about. Um, uh, Are there, Francois, specifically to you, but do you know other countries that have this same funding system and how do you handle OA book publishing from authors from countries where this policy is not in place and BPCs have to be paid by the author themselves? Yeah, so maybe I went through that a little bit quickly, but uh, what we tend to do is if someone, and the example I showed was uh, an author from uh, Nairobi, who did not, not have access to funds, did not have access to research funds. She didn't pay for her book. We, we paid for all the costs. Um, and the way we do that is partly through cross subsidization. So some books are more generously funded than others. I mean, that's just a, a reality. And we make that clear to, to the authors. Um, you know, we have authors from Norway who seem to have endless streams of, I don't know, salmon and oil money coming into their into their research accounts. So they fund us fairly generously and, and we'll use some of that sort of excess to fund. And of course we do also sell books. I mean, this is very hard for our local receiver to understand that we can be public benefit, not for profit and sell things. That doesn't square with them, but we don't sell a lot of books, but we sell some and it's enough money to fund maybe a book a year. So um, we encourage people from Africa in particular to submit to us and we'll always make try and make a plan to uh, to produce those books. It's not ABC or you know AB, APCs or nothing. I don't I don't want to create that uh, that impression. I can go back to the how do we get people to do this question, Abel. We didn't hear from you, and you're actually you're coming from Cielo is very successful at getting people to do. So if you could if you could maybe talk about that a little bit, is it about this is. You know, every country has these has these mandates, or how could you talk a little bit about why you think what's how you've been successful with Cielo? What's been the key? Okay, uh, thank you, Gary. Um, okay, I I I tried to to uh, connect my presentation that the success of the Cielo is very much related to 
uh, the topic of this panel, which, which are values, uh, as Catherine put in, in, in the beginning. So uh, all the development of Cielo in terms of uh, research project, in terms of uh, uh, technology, methodology, and the network and so on, all is built uh, around uh, concepts and the values towards you know, uh, the, the, the major um, belief that, that, that knowledge is a public good, you know, and the, that the knowledge is a social determinant of the development, that the information in society is like the blood in our body. You know? But what happens is that society, you know, the humankind, authorities, politicians you know, are not aware of that. They have, they say, sometimes they have uh, ideas that, that the research is important, that knowledge is critical and so on, mainly because of the COVID-19. But, but, but the authorities and the, let's say the elite, even some people of, of the research community, did not incorporate the idea that the knowledge is a determinant of, 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 of how we live and so on. And therefore, we that believe on that in, in several lines or, or beliefs needed to develop different models, you know, try you know, to uh, overcome the resistance, but we should always point uh, to the values and to the, the final objective. Thank you. Um, I, so we now, now we are going to close in a few minutes, so I don't, uh, but I want to make sure that um, everyone gets an opportunity because you're all together and you have this overlap. Is there anything anyone on the panel wants to draw out from each other or ask each other before we end this session? Good question. Joe, I mean, Joe sorry, Joe, do you yeah. have... Do you, have you worked at all with this new Quartz OA group that is trying to launch these micro donation sources of funding for publications? No, I haven't. Just wondered if, if anybody has, in fact, they're, they're brand new, but they could be an interesting intermediary between libraries and, and small, small, small journals or small, small, small book publishers. Yeah. Anyway, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I mean, I, 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 what I think for me is that it's so, sort of comes across from this panel so clearly is that, you know, you have this real, you know, moment of, of opportunity, I think, for, for open publishing. And I think it's, it's what's kind of exciting for me is that you have um, really quite sort of transformative different ways of understanding, uh, understanding the landscape. And, uh, you know, and whereas I think once open book publishing was kind of... Uh, struggling i think for, for you know for, for recognition i think um, with you know with some of these hopefully new infrastructures and new new sets of practices new relationships i you know i i, I can't help but feel optimistic about the futures right so so yeah i suppose that's the final reflection thank you i want to thank all of you for um for your really fantastic presentations and for um helping this collections librarian know that there is there is hope and uh, that there are really good opportunities out there for us to take advantage of. So thank you. And I'll turn it over to um, to the OASPA chair. Thank you, Carrie. Thanks. Thank you.